Good morning. I feel like we forgot how to celebrate mass. We're running around trying to get everything done, but I think we got there now. What a beautiful gospel. It's one of my, one of my favorite gospels. I, I like to say that every Sunday. This is one of my favorite gospels, but it really is one of my favorite gospels. It's so rich, even though it's not very long. You know, when Jesus shows the apostles his hands, what's on those hands? This is, this is a sermon I've preached two or three times. He shows them his wounds. And he's telling them, peace be with you. And the last time they were in this room together, he washed their feet. See, this is the upper room. This is the room of the Last Supper. We've gone back to the upper room. But a lot has happened since the last time they were all together here. What's happened? The Garden of Gethsemane has happened. Peter's denial has happened. Judas has hung himself. They've all been scattered. Jesus has been mocked, crucified buried and rose from the dead and now they come back together and and you just think about that moment for the apostles you can imagine there's anything but peace in their heart right i mean anything but peace they're filled with regret they're filled with shame They've turned their back, they've denied, they've run away, they've hidden after their promises of fidelity. And what does Jesus say to them? What do I say to you this morning? Peace. Why don't you pray for peace? I mean, even now, in this moment, just pray, God, send me the gift of peace. And hear Jesus say to you, my peace be with you. And he breathes on them the breath of God. Only two times the breath of God is mentioned in scripture. One, when he breathes on the dust of the earth, right? And now Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit. You know, in Catholic theology, they, they were ordained on Holy Thursday night when Jesus washed their feet, which was part of the ordination rite of priests in the Old Testament being bathed. When he washed their feet and he commanded them in the sacrifice of the Last Supper, do this in memory of me, those components together are part of the ordination. So they've received this gift and now they're back in the upper room and they get another, another dimension of their ministry. And what is it? He breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit, whose what? Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. As the Father has sent me, and why did the Father send Jesus, I like to ask? And there's a thousand right answers to that question. But in this moment, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He breathed on them and gave them the power to do what? Forgive sins. As the Father has sent me, why did the Father send the Son into the world? For the forgiveness of sins, for the establishment of the kingdom, for a calling to truth, for a renewal of humanity that we would be washed clean and made whole from the squalor of sin so the breath of god and this isn't even pentecost the breath of god is breathed from jesus upon them they receive this one gift the forgiveness of sins which is a pretty big gift and we're anticipating the fullness of Pentecost. In the Acts of the Apostles today, we heard this line read, when the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, 
Now, Pentecost was a Jewish holiday. Pentecost is not just a Christian holiday, a holy day. Pentecost was a Jewish holy day, a Jewish holiday, and it celebrated the harvest festival. It was a harvest festival, but it was even more than a harvest festival. It was a memorial feast where the Jews celebrated a special liturgy, a special worship in memory of something. And what was the Feast of Pentecost in memory of? It was in memory of the giving of the law. Remember what happens to the Jews. They escape from Egypt. And that's the Passover, right? And 50 days later comes Pentecost. That's what Pentecost means, 50. So 50 days later comes Pentecost. So Passover to Pentecost, the escape from slavery to Mount Zion, and at Mount Zion, the giving of the law. And what happens when the law is given in the Old Testament? When the law was given in the Old Testament, there was fire and thunder and lightning and the mountain was wrapped in this cloud of fire and that's what the Jews were celebrating on their Pentecost and so what happens at the Christian Pentecost when the Christians are gathered together on the feast of Pentecost what happens the rushing wind not just the breath of God out of the mouth of Jesus now but this Ruah, this power of God, the Spirit of God comes and it obviously it makes a loud noise. You know what I think of when I hear about this rushing loud wind? Every time there's a tornado in the south, right? They stick the microphone in front of somebody and they say, what was it like? And what do they say? It was like a, a train coming. You've all heard that interview, haven't you? I remember a friend of mine in college named Mike Allen said, if I ever get caught in a tornado, I'm not saying it. I'm not, I don't even care if it sounds like a train, I'm still not saying it. So the wind comes and the tongues of fire and the tongues of fire tie the Old Testament Pentecost to the New Testament Pentecost. And these tongues of fire come to rest on the apostles and they go out and they begin, they're transformed from fear to courage. They've received another gift. They've transformed from fear to courage and they go out and they begin to proclaim the glory of God. They proclaim the Messiah. They proclaim the good news and something miraculous happens. What's happening? Everybody is hearing them in their own native language. And what we're supposed to know is that the human family was scattered at the Tower of Babel. Y'all remember this story, the Tower of Babel? The quick reminder of the Tower of Babel. In the Old Testament, humanity decided that they were going to make a name for themselves. A name, they were going to glorify themselves. So in their effort to glorify themselves, they decided to build a tower to heaven. They were going to go to heaven on their own power and they were going to glorify themselves. That's what's happening at Babel. And what does God do? He scatters them because the pride of humanity is leading them to worship themselves. Can you imagine such a thing? It is the perennial temptation, the idolatry of self, to make ourselves the measure of all things, to become our own God. But anyway, I digress. The Tower of Babel. And so God, in the one sense, in his mercy, scatters them and he does what? He divides their, their language. And so what happens through pride and discord in the scattering of humanity, now at Pentecost, what's being healed? The language of humanity is coming back together in a symbolic way. And so the apostles 
proclaim the truth and everybody hears it in their own language. Love and the Spirit is gathering the church back together. A few years, not even a few years ago, earlier this year, I had the privilege to travel to India before the corona. I got to go to India and, you know, there's 1.3 billion people in India, 1.3 billion. They've, I forget the number, but they graduated some, you know, hundreds of thousands of engineers in the last years or two. They're building this kind of tech machine over there. It's a third world country and a first world country together. And I was touring around India with a, a friend of mine, a, a Catholic priest, Father Satish, some of you know him. And I said, India is gonna be a superpower. And he said, India will never be a superpower. And I said, why not? And he said, because we're divided by our language. You know, in every state in India, they speak a different language. It's like going to Alabama and they speak Alabama and go to Georgia and they speak Georgia. It really is. And so it's, they have a common language of Hindi, but not everybody speaks Hindi by any stretch of the imagination. So they're divided and they don't want to learn each other's language. It's like, I'm not learning Alabama. They got to learn Mississippi, you know? And so he said, they're divided. And you know, we can be, and this again, we, we cannot, the church cannot allow herself to be divided. The Holy Spirit wants to unite us. Satan is a divider. The Spirit is a uniter. And so this beautiful gift that comes on the apostles speaking the language of the world. And so our faith must speak the language of the world. Pentecost, the beginning of the church, the outpouring of the gifts of the Spirit. There are different spirits, different gifts, but there is one Spirit. There are different workings, but one God who pr produces them all. What are the gifts of the Spirit? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, courage, piety, fear of the Lord. Those beautiful gifts and then the fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, chastity, these gifts and fruits. What gifts and fruits do you want? I know one that you want. Peace be with you. And hear Jesus say to you, receive the gift of peace. My peace I give you. But what otherwise, what gifts do you want? I was asked this question a few years ago. When I was in the seminary, we had a Life in the Spirit seminar. We did that here last year. We had about 60 or 80 people come participate. It was a great thing. But I did it when I was in seminary, Life in the Spirit seminar. And they asked us, not just in a moment, but over a period of time. We did it over a six-week period, this seminar. And one of the first questions was, what gifts do you want? Mike O'Connor, what gifts do you want? You need to go pray about it and write it down. What do you want? And now I'm asking you all to do that. What gifts of God do you want? What gifts of the Holy Spirit do you want to be particularly manifested in your life? Say, oh no, Father Mike, that would be selfish for me to ask those things. Baloney, God wants to give you these gifts. God wants to give you these gifts. He wants to find you open to receive them. What do you want? And I remember, and I've told this story a few times, I remember very particularly that I wanted, I was in the seminary, I wanna be able to preach. I would like to be able to teach. I prayed for the gift of healing. And I prayed for the gift of discernment of spirit. 
that I would be able to discern. Those were the four that I felt like God was asking me to ask for. So I prayed very deliberately, very seriously. You know, God wants to, not only God wants to, God has poured out his spirit upon the church and those gifts that come into the body of Christ, you're destined for certain gifts in the church to build up the body of Christ. Have you discovered those gifts? Have you even asked for those gifts? Have you prayed about what God wants to give you? On this Pentecost Sunday, pray. What do you want? What gifts of the Spirit would you receive to build up your family in faith, to build up Our Lady of the Gulf or your home parish in faith, to build up your community in faith? What, what do you think you could be a good steward of? What do you want? I prayed for the discernment of spirits. I don't want to be gullible. I want to know truth when I hear it. I want to know the voice of Satan and the voice of God. I want to be able to discern. As I became a priest, I realized that discernment of spirits was so much more than that. I discovered a book called Discernment of Spirits. So I read that book, right? I read that book so that I would grow in this gift. You say, Father Mike, if it's a gift from God, God will just drop it on you. He'll just infuse it in you. He'll just plug you in and you don't have to do any work, right? Say wrong. Wrong. No, God expects us. He will give these gifts, but then he... They build on our nature. I remember again, and I won't go on and on, but I remember another little story. And I, you all know, many of you all know, I'm kind of a fan of a guy named Dr. Scott Hahn. And Dr. Hahn talks about when he was a young man and first discovered the gift of faith, he prayed. He prayed for this gift. He prayed, Lord, I want a love for sacred scripture. And boy, he got that gift. Does that mean he doesn't have to study sacred scripture? Does that mean he doesn't have to do hard work? And maybe that was his nature to study ancient languages. Maybe it was in his nature to be interested in um, covenants. But if he wasn't a servant of God, he might just be teaching ancient literature somewhere, right? So God uses our natural gifts and infuses them with the Holy Spirit. So my brothers and sisters, what gifts has God given you that might be lied under the ground like buried treasure? You know that story in the gospel where the kingdom of God is like a, a treasure buried in a field and you got to go out and dig. God has gifts for you rich, beautiful, powerful, life-changing, church-changing, family-transforming gifts for you. Have you asked for them? On this Pentecost Sunday, I say, peace be with you. Receive that gift. And pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you would be the man the woman, the father, the mother, the husband, the friend, the son, the daughter, the priest that God wants you to be.